Hi quilting friends, it's me Carolina Moore, your favorite sewing and quilting YouTuber and today I have a requested video and that is talking about binding. In a previous video I said check out my binding video and it turns out that while I have many videos where I show binding as part of a project, I don't have a single video on just binding and so that's today's 100% this video is all about binding and I'm even going to shrink that down a little bit more and say it's just about machine binding a quilt. In the future I'll see about putting together a video for you on hand binding a quilt but machine binding has become more and more accepted. If you are doing a quilt to enter in a quilt show you do want to hand bind that quilt if you can. It just gives it that, that polish but for quilts especially quilts that are going to get a lot of use, they're going to go through the wash. Machine binding is not only quicker, but you can feel really secure in that seam that you've attached that binding with. So that's what we're going to talk about today, machine binding a quilt, and I'm going to machine bind a quilt with you from start to finish. Let's get started. So here I have my strips. I've already cut them to two inches. Two inches is my preferred size for binding. Now, if you watch five different binding videos, you're going to get five different methods for binding and your right method for binding might be one person's method or it might be somewhere in the middle. Um, it really kind of a, some, some parts are science, but some parts are like trial and error to figure out what works best with your machine, what works best for you. By the way, today I'm doing everything on my Baby Lock Jubilant. This is a fairly simple machine. You don't need a big, hefty, like gigantic or industrial machine to attach a binding by machine. So we are going to just do this on the Jubilant. I do have a video on binding with a Baby Lock Sashiko machine that's normally sitting behind me in the frame. She's actually sitting over on my table because I'm working on a Sashiko quilt right now. But if you want to see how to bind a quilt with a Sashiko machine, you can grab that link here and see how to bind with Sashiko. But we're just going to do regular machine binding on my Baby Lock Jubilant today. I have my two inch strips. Our first step is going to be to take all of these strips and make them into one long strip. How many strips do I have? Well, you measure around your quilt and you wanna give yourself at least 10 inches, but 10 inches is really the minimum. If you can give yourself more room at the ends, then that's great. But if you are trying to squeeze the binding out of what you have left of fabric, if you have 10 inches extra, you'll be fine. It just might be a little trickier, but tricky is not a big deal. Tricky isn't hard. Tricky is just, eh, it's a little tricky. Okay, so I have all of my strips and I need to turn them into one long strip for my binding. This is the fabric that I chose. I was actually gonna go with the same fabric that I had on the back of my quilt for this quilt, but because I'm doing this video for you, I wanted a binding where you could really see the contrast so you could see what I was working on. Um, so I went with a light colored binding. And what we're gonna do is just lay one piece down and then the other piece down. Now you can see that I have selvages left here on my fabric. That's totally okay. I'm gonna be cutting those off in a little bit. And all I'm doing is making an L shape or like a plus shape with these two. If you want to add a pin here, you can, you don't need to. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna stitch from one corner all the way across to the other corner. And when we stitch from one corner to the other corner, we wanna make sure that there are four corners here that we've picked the right two corners. Some people will find that they accidentally have stitched this way and then their binding ends up like this, which means you just stitched a different selvage on there, not what you were going for. So the trick is you want to stitch from this corner to this corner, which means that you are bisecting, so dividing in half, dividing in two, this square with the pieces you wanna keep, so your long pieces on one side, and the pieces you're gonna cut off, so your short little pieces, on the other side. So that's the line that you're gonna sew. You're gonna sew the line separating what you're keeping and what you're cutting off. Easy enough. So we're just gonna take this over to the machine. I happen to have a quarter inch foot on here, but really any foot that doesn't have a guide should be fine for stitching because we're just stitching from one corner to the other corner. If you wanted to draw a line here that you could follow, you absolutely can. If you wanted to use seam tape, and seam tape is some really smart stuff, you can grab the link right up here. 
to uh, see how seam tape works. Um, but seam tape is great to use here. I'm just gonna eyeball it because I don't have my seam tape handy and I want to get going. Okay, make sure that my, yep, my machine is threaded. Presser foot is down and off we go. So I just eyeballed it, but yes, you can absolutely draw a line. You can absolutely um, use seam tape, whatever guides you have to help you draw that or make that line straight. Then, now generally I sew all of them and then cut them. I'm going to show you this and then we're gonna go ahead and quickly add all the strips. So I'm cutting this off and cutting off my seam allowance at the same time. You can do this with a rotary cutter and ruler if you want. I'm gonna show you what this looks like here. There we go. So you can take a rotary cutter and ruler and just cut it off. And then I like cutting off my dog ears at the same time so that it's all set. But you're cutting this off to a quarter inch and you can see that mine's a little bit wavy. It's a quarter inch-ish. It's my favorite size in quilting, quarter inch-ish. If it's not a perfect quarter inch, that's okay. It's going into the binding. You don't want it too big because the seam allowance is adding bulk. You don't want it too small because the binding is important in holding the quilt together and you don't want this to pop apart. But yeah, I mean, if you're within a couple threads of a quarter inch, you're totally fine. So this is our waist. We're gonna throw this away and I'm going to keep going, taking all these strips and adding them together onto my one strip so that we're making one big giant long strip. And again, any of these like dots from the seam or from the selvage, I wanna make sure that those don't end up in the binding. So I'm just gonna take this. Okay, so now I have all of them sewn together I'm just going to carefully come in here with my scissors because I chain piece these and cut the chains that are between all the strips. And then I'm going to cut off the extra. So I cut up, across, and down, and that cuts off my seam allowance or my, uh, <laughs> my selvage show that again up across and down with my quarter inch ish seam allowance okay I have all of my selvages trimmed off so all my seam allowances are cut to that quarter inch ish and it's time to go ahead and press so I'm gonna go ahead and press my binding in half. Again, I used a two inch binding. Some people are gonna use a two and a half inch binding. Some people are gonna use a two and a quarter inch binding. I've used all these different sizes throughout my quilting career so far. And I settled on two inches. That's what I really liked, especially for machine binding. But there's no hard and fast rule. Like a seam allowance should be a quarter inch. That's a hard and fast rule that we have. But a binding we are a little more flexible on what size people choose to make their bindings Okay, here I've made it to one of my seams and you want to press your seams open. It doesn't matter if you are an open presser or a to side presser. When you make your quilts, when it comes to binding, you are an open presser. And the reason is, and I'll show you in a second, well, let's go ahead and press this in half. The reason is because of the amount of bulk that gets added to the binding by the seam. And you'll see, so when it gets attached to the binding it's actually going to get attached like this and then like this and then it's going to get folded over yet again 
And so the number of extra layers that is created by that seam allowance can create a lump in your quilt binding if you don't open up that seam allowance. So always press open on the binding, even if you are by rule a side presser. So I'm gonna keep going down, just pressing this in half and pressing my seams open as I get to them. Okay, I now have all this fabulous binding made. I'm going to put my iron to the side because we're not done using it yet. And I generally roll up my binding in some way so it's not just some big pile. I don't want it to get tangled, but there's no rule. There are some really cute options for rolling up your binding around like cute little spools. So our next step is to grab our quilt and this is a new quilt pattern that I have. It uses scrap tape, which I have another video on. I will link to that down below, but if you want to see that scrap tape video and this is just a fun quilt, I am using this binding. I don't know that this would be like my first choice in binding for this quilt, but we're going to see how it works. If I hate it, I can always tear it off and do a different binding. It's not the end of the world. So here we go. Here's our quilt that we're going to put our binding on. And you can see this fabric is actually in the quilt in several places, but I am putting a white binding on a cream background. So that's a little hmm, different. I don't know. Like we'll see how that goes, but I love how it's kind of pink and scrappy colored and that's going to pull the pink and scrappy colors from this quilt to the edge. Uh, a great choice for binding, just generally speaking, is a stripe. Stripes just always look fabulous as binding. I don't know why. I don't make the rules. Stripey bindings always have my heart. So striping bindings are also really great. So this is just going to go on my quilt and I'm gonna lay it up against the edge and I'm just gonna sew it on with a quarter inch seam allowance. Nothing fancy about it. Two things that you do want is you wanna start in from a corner. You don't want to start at a corner and you want to give yourself a long tail to start. If you have more than 10 inches that you've left yourself, make it a good 10 inches. So we are attaching this to the front of the quilt and just using a quarter inch seam allowance all the way around. And the one last tip is make sure you have enough bobbin thread when you do this, or if you are running low on bobbin thread, then you wanna make sure that you keep an eye on the back so that you don't end up stitching really long seams or stitching on a lot of this uh, binding and then finding out later, oh gosh darn it, I was stitching with air, not with thread because I ran out of bobbin. So that's just the other little tip as you were sewing on your binding. Okay, getting to a corner is when this differs from just regular stitching with a quarter inch seam allowance. When we get to a corner, we need to pivot this binding around the corner. It's really simple to do. We're going to fold it. So the binding is a 90 degree angle here and it's a 45 degree angle there and you don't need to get out a compass and measure that. You're just folding it to make a perfect L right here. And so that this point right here hits right up against the corner of the quilt top. Then we're gonna flip this over to the other direction. And also flip, this is our little shark tail. We're flipping our shark tail the other direction. And now we're gonna stitch right up to this corner. When we get to this corner, we're gonna do a couple stitches forward and back just to anchor it. And then you can actually cut your thread or you can just flip over and do the other side and then cut your loops later. This machine doesn't have an automatic thread cutter, so I will cut my loops later. But if I had a machine with an automatic thread cutter, I would just cut the threads right there. 
So let's go ahead and do that and I'll walk you through those steps. I'm stitching right up to that crease, so I'm not stitching over the shark tail. I'm going back and forth. Needle up, press her foot up, and then I'm going to flip this. I would also cut my thread at that point if I had an automatic thread cutter on the machine. The Jubilant doesn't have that, not a big deal. Couple stitches forward, couple stitches back to anchor this. And we keep going. And if you want to do it now so you don't forget later, find that little thread loop on the front and there's really not much to cut on the back so you can just leave that there. And we're going to continue this process all the way around the quilt, making sure to do our corners at each of the corners. There's really no avoiding that. You're gonna hit a corner. You're gonna have to do your little flippy at the corner. Once you've done one or two quilts with the corners, they're so simple. It's not difficult at all. It's just a new technique you haven't done before. So do it a couple times. It'll no longer be new and it'll be super easy. Okay, so now we've made it almost all the way around. We want to give ourselves a little bit of space between the two ends, a good eight or 10 inches, depending on yeah, how big your quilt is. If you're working on a really small quilt and the edges are only 10 inches, you definitely want to go in about a half inch on each corner if you can, and then give yourself some room between your two tails for putting the two tails together. Now, one thing that didn't happen while I was putting the binding on that I kind of hoped would happen so I could show you what it looks like is that I never ended up with one of these seams at a corner. And that can happen. When you have a seam at a corner, it adds extra bulk at a corner and you are going to have more bulk at a corner because of all the pieces that are folded over on top of each other. So if you can, it's always nice if you can avoid having a seam in a corner. An easy way to do that is to lay out your quilt, pin where you're going to start your binding, and then just lay out the binding all the way around your quilt, folding all your little corners as you go around and seeing if you get a seam on your binding in one of those corners. If you do, adjust your starting point, either higher or lower, and then go again. If you're doing a quilt for a show where you really want everything to be so good, then yes, do that. As you can see, I don't usually do that. If I end up with a seam at the corner, I end up with a seam at the corner. So completely personal preference for you and also where the intended end of this quilt is going to be, where it's going to go on how you decide if you're going to really plan your binding or if you're just gonna get it done. And if you're one of my kids, you know that done is my favorite. But if you're one of my kids, you're probably not watching this video because my kids are not big quilters. Okay, so we are going to attach our two ends of our binding. And this is actually an interesting case, speaking of seam allowances, because we have a seam right here, right at the end of the binding. And I don't want a seam right here and then a seam a couple inches later. I just feel, I mean, who's gonna look at this, this binding that closely? Nobody but I'll know. So I'm just going to go ahead and open this up right at the seam. And then I'm going to unpick with giant quilting scissors, of course. <laughs> I'm going to just unpick some of this seam to give myself a little more room because I have that space here. Okay, so now I've given myself a longer tail here. Let's go ahead and put our seam together. So I'm gonna go ahead and lay this flat. Let me move my mat there so I can, get, there we go, nice and flat. And this is going to be my bottom tail. This is going to be my top tail. It doesn't matter which is which. 
Let me open this up. There we go. Now, since I already have this at an angle, I could go ahead and go with this angle for my um, binding, but I want to show you, you're almost never going to run into this situation, so I want to show it to you with just a straight. There we go. A straight edge. So there's our straight edge. And we need these two to come together at that mitered corner, like we have the angled corner. And the question is, where do I cut this piece to make it match up with this piece? There's a super, super simple trick to do that. You want the overlap of the two strips to be the same as the width of your binding. I'm gonna say that again. You want the overlap of the two strips to be the same as the width of your binding. So I know that my binding is two inches. I can go ahead and just make a mark on here and then measure two inches from that mark and then cut. Totally easy. Now, if you are in some weird, crazy quilters twilight zone where you don't have a ruler around, an easy, easy way to do this is you just cut off a little piece from your binding here open it up, make sure that depending on how you cut it, you're doing the width of the binding, not the length of the binding. And I'm just going to go from here. I can see that there's the edge of my binding. I'm just gonna go from here to here. And that's exactly where I'm gonna cut my binding. So simple. If you've never seen this method before, so crazy simple, there we go. And now it's just a matter of stitching the two ends together at a miter. We've done that a bunch of times before because we made the binding that same way. We're taking our two pieces. You wanna make sure that there is not going to be a twist in your binding. Okay, that's good. I'm gonna put it under the machine and how do we sew our angle? Same way as before, we sew our angle between the two corners that are going to have what we wanna keep on one side and what we wanna cut off on the other. So we're just matching up our edges and sewing that seam. Before you cut anything off, you just wanna double check to make sure that there are no twists. There are no twists, that looks flat and smooth, looks really good. Now I get to cut off to my quarter inch-ish seam allowance. I want to press this open. I have my iron close by, but generally I don't. So I'll just usually finger press this. You wanna be careful, I try not to stretch the fabric when I'm finger pressing it because there is that bias in there. And then there we go, that's just ready to stitch on. So I'm gonna start stitching about an inch of overlap stitching here, and then I'm gonna keep stitching and overlap my stitching about an inch on the other end to make sure that I'm not leaving any gaps or holes. And our binding is attached to the front. Okay, now we're getting ready to attach our binding to the back, and I'm going to introduce something that you are, I'm sure, really familiar with, but maybe not in quilting, and that is school glue. Now I've had it sitting upside down over here so that the glue will go towards the tip, especially when your glue is a little empty. Having it not near the tip of the, the glue bottle can get a little annoying, so I usually try to keep mine upside down. Sometimes I'll have like a cup or a bowl around that I can put it in to kind of keep it upside down. And this is what we're going to use to attach the binding to the back of the quilt, temporarily. We're gonna baste it to the back of the quilt with the glue. And I want to press my binding from the front. Oh, just open like this. Because that's going to help when we actually sew our binding. So you can kind of press into this if you want. I'm gonna leave it alone and I'm gonna allow my miter to set when I attach the binding to the back of the quilt. 
So just gonna do a quick pressing, just setting the seam on the binding. Okay, now we're here on the back of our quilt and we're gonna glue baste the binding to the back. And we're just using school glue. This is washable, it is water soluble, and it will not do any damage to your quilt. You are using really the tiniest little bit as well. And then we're ironing it and the iron is going to smoosh it flat and smooth. So it's not like if you were a kindergartner or have a kindergartner that made those like glue things where they then put all the glitter on it and you have these thick, hard chunks of glue that if you put that underneath your sewing machine needle, it would totally break your needle if your needle like stabbed into that. That won't happen here because we're using the tiniest bit and it's going really smooth and flat. And you'll see that in a second. So what I do, I'm going to start here on kind of the middle of one edge. I'm gonna open up my glue and I'm doing the tiniest. Come on. You can see just the tiniest little line of glue, a thin little line, and it's got little broken spots in there, totally fine. We're not looking for 100% coverage here. We're just wanting it to tack it in place. Then you wanna fold over your binding so that it goes just past your stitching line. So all the glue is in this seam allowance of the binding, and we are bringing the binding over just past the seam. And so here we can see the binding from the front. Doesn't that look so pretty? And look, look at those dots. They just lined up so perfect. That happens sometimes. Okay, so that's what we'll be doing all the way around. Now I wanna show you how it works on a corner. So I've just taken my finger and I've pulled this to the front. And when doing a corner, same thing. I'm just putting the littlest, tiniest, come on. tiniest amount of glue and I'm just going all the way up to the corner and you can see the angle right there Ooh, almost burned myself with the iron there we go so you can see that angle right there so now when I go down this side I'll show you real quick that is a pretty miter. And then I'll double check on the other side. Yep, there's a pretty miter there as well. So you've got that really nice, crisp, 45 degree angle line on the binding. I've got some extra threads here. I'm just gonna trim those so they're not sticking out of my binding in any way. There we go. Went a little heavy on the glue over in this corner, so I'm just gonna wipe some away. And ironing it actually just dries that glue up real fast. It sets it, so you don't have to like sit there and put like a clip on it and wait for it to dry. So there we go. That's one corner. I'm just gonna keep going like this all the way around until I have the whole thing glue bound. And then it's ready for finishing it with the machine stitching. So I have the entire binding glued to the back and you can see it's all glued on there. And again, it is just covering the 
stitching line. So you can't see the stitching line on the back. It's a little bit over, maybe just shy of an eighth of an inch, but about an eighth of an inch or so, just past that stitching line. And now we are going to stitch it from the front and we're going to stitch it, there we go, just right next to this binding. And you can feel through that if you stitch right next to this binding, you're going to catch the edge of the binding on the back. Oh, and I still have some glue on my fingers from gluing that down. But yes, you're gonna stitch right through here and you're gonna catch the edge of this binding on the back and your stitching is going to be almost invisible on the front. To make it even more invisible, what I've done is I've grabbed the thread that I used when I stitched this. I stitched this with a Sashiko machine. Sashiko machine only uses bobbins. So I have an extra bobbin of thread that I used for this background stitching. And I just went ahead and put that in my bobbin and or put that in that extra bobbin in the top of my machine and then in the bobbin because that's also important the bobbin is what's going to show on the back is I have a thread that matches this so I have a white thread in the back so it won't be as visible on the back and I'm going to stitch right in this edge with this same thread that's used here so it won't be that visible from the front either okay so we're going to go ahead and stitch this right in here I have to get out my readers for this because I want to make sure that I'm stitching. Oh, let's see, see that's so much better. Right, there we go. Next to that binding. Now, if you accidentally stitch on the binding for a stitch or two, it's not the end of the world. You don't need to cry. You still have a finished quilt. If you really hate it, yes, you can unpick it and go restitch that part, but just go slow. And we are stitching right next to that binding. Now I know you're curious, so we're gonna go ahead and take a peek at the back. And you can see on the back, you just see this line of stitching that is just catching that binding edge. And if there's any spot where it doesn't catch for some reason, you can always go back and just hand stitch that part down just to keep it secure. But it's that simple. I'm just gonna keep going and stitching this all the way around, stitching it down. Okay, when we get to a corner, you want to be able to get that needle right in that corner. And then you're just going to lift your presser foot up, pivot your quilt, put your presser foot down, and then keep stitching. And then the only other thing you wanna do here is you wanna double check to make sure that you caught that whole corner and that corner is stitched down well. So I'm just gonna flip this over, look. Yep, there was just a little bit of this corner for some reason, it didn't quite catch it. So I'll go back and I will hand stitch down this corner a little bit just to make sure that that gets fully stitched down. It just barely, it must have shifted a little bit while it was under the presser foot. So that's, I mean, it happens, it's okay. There's a lot of bulk going on in that corner. I will go back and hand tack that down. It happens sometimes. So we'll just keep on stitching all the way around. And I might wanna put a pin or a mark there, but I'll remember that I need to go back and hand stitch that down. Because otherwise, especially if this is being given as a gift, when I gift this quilt the first time that they wash it, because I do want the quilts that I gift to be actually used, the first time that they wash it, that corner will come up because that water soluble glue, it's just temporary. It's not, it's not permanent. It's not gonna hold it down. So there you go. That's how simple it is to machine attach a binding to a quilt. It is a 100% perfectly acceptable way to attach bindings to a quilt. If anyone ever tells you, oh, if it's not hand bound, it's not really, you know what, a quilt in my closet that still needs binding, that I can't gift because it still needs binding, that I don't have to, the time to bind, that's not, that's not helpful. So machine binding is perfect, wonderful, acceptable, makes it super washing machine friendly. You don't have to worry about any of your stitches um, coming out. It's very, very sturdy and it's a fast way to finish a quilt. So I love machine binding quilts and I do it on a lot of my quilts.
So friends, if you have any questions or comments, leave those down below. If this video was helpful to you, give it a thumbs up. And if you're part of any quilting groups, go ahead and share this video in quilting groups so they too can learn how quick and easy it is to machine bind quilts. I love sharing this information with everyone and I hope that you'll share it on with other people as well. Make sure you are subscribed to this channel. There are lots more videos coming and I have a lot here. So make sure that you look around my YouTube channel and check out the different videos that I have on all kinds of quilting things. Thanks so much for watching my friends. I will see you right here real soon. Bye for now.